Good afternoon and welcome to the Snooker Gym Live, our second session of our new Snooker Gym Live series. Thank you very much for uh, attending and all your interest. Uh, we've had some fantastic questions in the uh, pre-launch to this show and I'm looking forward to answering some of those and your live questions as well. Don't forget there will be a prize that we'll post out to you for the winner of the best question in pre-show questions and the best live question as well. So keep those questions posting and I'll have a look at them after we've gone through the uh, first topic. Make sure you've, uh, t you tell your friends, I'll give you a few seconds now just to do that, to tell your friends that the live show is happening. Maybe share it on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, your channels, your friends, email. Just let people know that the show's happening. We'll be going for 45 minutes. <clears throat> and in that time we'll cover how to screw back and how not to screw back. And covering the pre-show questions and the live questions as well. At the end of the show we'll announce the prize winners. So keep tuned until 2.45pm GMT. So to start off, what we'll be discussing, as we uh, said before the show, is how to screw back and how not to screw back. I'm going to answer that question very briefly. We'll take five or ten minutes to do that in two halves. First of all, what not to do, and secondly, what to do. So, the first, and I'm going to write here on the, so don't, don't do's and don'ts, okay? So the first don't is holding tight. Second don't is backswing quick. Third don't is short backswing. Okay. So these are all related to each other and I see this happen all the time in players below 50 break standard. A lesser so on players between 50 to 100 break standard, that meaning their highest break, and even players beyond 100, although it gets less so as the standard of the player gets better. So the first mistake is players are holding too tight because their body thinks screw back equals strength equals force equals power, let's strangle the cue. That's not what you want to do. You want to hold it loosely and gently. The other thing that players tend to do is, especially with screw back, hit the ball with the backswing. So their, their, their backswing is far too quick to keep under control. So what happens is, as they're pulling the cue back too quickly, over accelerating it, that equals muscle tension. And as we said last time, muscle tension on the cue, look what happens when I tighten the hand, it's moving the tip and the shaft all over the place. So extra tension in the hand equals moving the cue off the line of aim. If I point that to the camera, it's probably quite rude, but holding, gripping the cue tight shifts the tip both up and down and left to right. So the other thing that happens is players are scared of a full backswing because they feel they're losing control as they pull the cue back they feel they're losing control so they'll compensate for that by having a short backswing so players end up being tight quick and short so something like this and then there's no power there's no control and as you can see and and then, there's, and then the cue just cannot stay on the line of aim. So if we do the opposite of that, which is, you may have seen the video this week where we had the zero technique, where you just hold the cue with two fingers. So where we can use a pendulum action just to use move the cue very smoothly backwards and forwards. So 
doesn't require any physical force. You just have a look there how gentle that is. It doesn't require physical force to screw back. The weight of the cue is four or five times heavier than the cue ball. That's plenty. Just the natural inertia of the cue going through from the, if we think of the arm as a pendulum. As it comes back, it wants to go forward with gravity, and that inertia and the weight of the cue is enough to put the spin on the ball. So the extra contact with a full grip just gives an extra sense of feel and control. But what most players think is, if the hands uh, got full contact on the cue, then that means it has to be tight, but it doesn't. So then the other uh, main issues I see with screwback is players thinking they have to dig down with the cue like this to get a screw back, but that just jumps the cue ball and it also makes it easier to swerve the ball by mistake and it also makes it more difficult to sight the shot as well. If your cue's up at a steep angle, you don't have both balls in your line of vision. For example, so what I mean by that is look, if we, well, if you're the player there, you can see if if your eyes are higher above the white ball, you don't see the line of aim as well as if the balls are here in the same level, like a rifle shooter. And the, the converse of that is players wanting to get parallel to the table with the cue. So they hear the dogma, I have to get parallel with the cue. And what that does is if we zoom in on the bridge hand here, we can see that as we go lower and lower to the table, I lose the integrity of the bridge hand. So as I go too low, then I lose the integrity of the bridge hand, and then I've got no control over the cue, it's moving from side to side. So a big mistake is for players to try and flatten the bridge too much. Okay. You can even see it here. You can see a decent V here. If I flatten too much, you lose the V. So what to do? Go as low as you can, keeping a solid V for the cue. And then, for me, that is here. So the lowest I can hit the ball with a parallel cue and a decent V is about here. So what I need to do is keep the V and just lift the butt of the cue an inch or two and then I can bring the tip down here. And then you can still get control of the cue but you're not digging down too much. That's the happy medium and you'll see the pros doing that as well. The other mistake, the last mistake, is playing screw shots differently to other shots. So you'll hear wonderful, helpful advice in the clubs like hold the cue tighter, hold the cue looser, move it quicker, move it slower. Play it in a different way to the way you play every other shot on the table. Uh, have a quick backswing, have a slower backswing. When you hit the ball, yank the cue back. But that's just introducing another variable. So what we want is to hit, think of a default setting of hitting all the balls in the same way all of the time for consistency. So what that means is, and we're coming on to what to do now, the what to do stage. So what not to do, digging down or too flat. Number five, play differently. So what to do? Loose grip. So it's the example I give is holding a bird, or holding a, holding a bird in the hand just enough that, so she won't fly away, or holding a child's hand. 
you're not holding it so you're holding it firmly enough to keep it in position, but not so tight that it's uh, painful. So don't hurt the cube, whatever you do. So we want to be loose, as we, as we discussed already. And also the other thing is, I'm going to jump forward to number five. Which is playing every shot exactly the same. So, what you want to try and do is pretend that you're, uh, you're playing a topspin shot in the same way as a screw shot. So, imagine you're playing a topspin shot up here on the cue ball. Okay. Naturally goes forward. We want to push through the hand to the chest. We want to follow through all the way naturally. The players do exactly the opposite when they're playing a screw shot. They tend to go very quickly forward and yank the cue back as they hit the shot. But just pretend it's an upside down topspin shot. So pretend you're playing top spin, then move the tip to the bottom of the white and do the same thing. Follow through in the same way. Hand to the chest. Keep the tip there. That foul shot that I just played is a great target for practicing your screw shots. So if you can play the two foul shots, which are First of all, with top spin, let's play this one again, plus four on the white. So that's sent the white into the pocket. So I've done two fouls in two shots, followed the white in and screwed the white back to the tip. So what I'd recommend is play the top spin, the screw shot top spin, the screw shot in alternate shots to feel, number one, if there's a difference in the way you strike the ball on both shots, play with the same power, and, and number two, to confirm that they are actually being struck in the same way. So it's a great exercise to reveal differences in how you hit the ball, even subconsciously, a lot of us do that. So that's a great drill you can do. So going to number two, well, I've put Miss Q here, spell that wrong actually. So why should we Miss Q? Why should we why have I put Miss Q on learning how to play screw shots? When you're practicing, let's get an old piece of cloth uh, to protect the feelings of the club owner and his pocket. And what I've found is that most players are scared of miscuing, so they'll tend to hit too high on the cue ball. What that causes is a compensation at the last minute, because subconsciously we know we're aiming too high, and it causes body movement and lift, which ironically will give more chance of a miscue, because the player's lif lifting the shoulder to dig down on, to dig down on the cue ball. And then they have a miscue, and then the next shot they address even higher to avoid the miscue and do the problem even more until they reach a point where they can't do that anymore and they just end up stopping the cue ball. And that's when they think, oh, I'm not getting screw back, I need to hold even tighter and hit the ball even quicker, and then maybe I'll get some screw back. It's not the way it works. So when I say learning to miscue, have the courage, maybe when no one's watching, because it won't be so embarrassing, have the courage to go lower and lower on the ball, until, and you must miscue, until you miscue, so I'm going right down 
here now. Play them nice and soft. And now I'm going to go a little bit lower than that. See, even that didn't miss Q. So I was obviously still at minus four. My concept of minus four was a little bit too high. So we're going to go even lower. Plenty of chalk. Even lower on the white. So this is often what happens where the player has it ingrained into them not to miss Q. But go through that barrier. Keep going through that barrier. There, success. Finally, I, missed, I was able to miss Q. So what that teaches is the limit of the cue ball. Very few players do this. You can also do the same with topspin. Go higher and higher and higher until you miss Q. To learn the limits of the cue ball. Very few players do that. As a result, their limit for the height is between here and here. So they're restricted because most of the spin, most of top spin and screw back comes in here and comes in here. Okay. So the other thing is starting small. Think small to start with. Uh, we've done the fouls which was point four. So thinking small to start with is what we've been doing here, which is playing very gentle shots. And just coming back even six inches. You know, screw back for the yellow. And again, if you can play five, six, ten of those, and get that consistent in your game, then you'll be in great shape to gradually increase the length of screw back that you can perform under control. Remember, screw back is about control first and speed second. You only get to do Judd Trump specials if you've been playing and practicing about 15 years at a very high level. So over expectation is a very common mistake for learning screw back. So keep the questions coming in because I'm now going to move toward the pre-question. So what questions did we have before the show? So Tony Priddy from Tamworth and also Alan Rasen from Zagreb in Croatia had the same question. So should we cue on the chest? or not? Should the cue touch the chest when we're cueing at the table? That's a very good question and a very common source of doubt for players because they hear different advices from different places and they get into confusion. Well, what should I do? So, the quick answer is that it's a personal choice, a personal preference. So for example, I'll just demonstrate how I play, which is right-handed. I've got a gap between the chest and the cue. I don't know if you can see that from where you are. I've got a got a gap between the you can probably see it more easily from there. Yeah, so I've got a gap. slight gap between the chest and the cue. Whereas left-handed, which I need, I need that chest on the cue to get a sense of control. The way my body is formed, or the shape of the body, everyone's got a different uh, shape, 
then, and no one's symmetrical by the way, if you put your hands up, most snooker players have a different length of hand by stretching uh, because the bridge hand is uh, usually stretched a little bit, so we're not so perfectly symmetrical. So this just demonstrates that it's personal preference. Left handed, my body touches the chest. My, uh, my chest touches the cue when I'm queuing up naturally. If I try and push it away from the chest, I feel like I'm queuing around a corner. In the same way with right handed, if I try and push the chest onto the cue, I feel like I'm queuing around a corner, I feel very restricted. So it's a personal choice. Now, obviously, if we demonstrate, um, let's demonstrate stance. I'm just going to demonstrate something uh, that is relevant to the uh, chest position on the cue. So if we, I'll come around here. And this just demonstrates that, this just demonstrates that if we move the stance, it tends to move where the chest is on the cue. So for example, if I stand very square to the shot, and by the way, what I recommend is you test these parameters and just discover what the correct tension is on the, uh, on the cue uh, from the chest. Should it be lightly touching, bit of pressure away from the cue? You can test this by adjusting these parameters, which are, I'm square to the table, it tends to push the chest onto the cue. If my front foot goes a little bit further forward, you can see there's a bit more space in here now. If I go wider, it gives me a bit more space. Also, I'll demonstrate this here, if you turn the angle of this foot, you can see that moves the hip and the chest away from the cue. So moving Twisting the uh, back foot makes a difference. The position of the front foot makes a difference. And the width of the front foot makes a difference as well. So that's the, that's the hidden cause of the chest position on the cue. Here's the tripod that we have at the table, the stance, the foundation. And that comes first that to a degree dictates, uh, most importantly, where the head is on the cue. Your head has got to be in the correct position to see a straight shot as a straight shot. Some players are slightly outside, some players inside, some players central. That's another topic completely. <coughs> so the stance has got to offer us correct head position and a sense of freedom and control and straightness with the cue relative to the chest. So I'll just demonstrate that one more time from in front of the camera. So twisting the back foot gives us more space. Going a bit wider with the front foot changes the space between the chest and the cue. And going wider as well makes a difference. So thanks for those great questions guys. What have we got next? Ah, Jesse Thihu, my good friend from Holland, the one of the best screw backists from uh, on the internet. Watch his uh, channel and his uh, screw shots that he plays at home and lovely clearances to very heavy rock music. In fact, we're gonna I'm going to demonstrate stance again here because the question is. How do you deal with an uncomfortable back and adjust the stance position to take the strain off the back? So this is not an uncommon issue with players and we'll demonstrate that now. Let's go back to the stance view. So the quickest way to uh, release pressure on the back is to lower the hips. So the reason for that is if I'm 
standing as I normally do with the back leg straight. So I've got a bit of a, a tabletop back, a bit of a flat back. But if that's uncomfortable, and for some people leaning forward is uncomfortable on the small of the back, the obvious thing to do, and also the neck as well, can be problematic if you've got a flat back, we need to arc the head back to view the ball. So if I keep my head position fixed, that's my actual head position at the table. For some people that is not comfortable or even possible. So I had one client who can't even tip the head back five degrees. So he had to find a way of keeping the neck and the back in one line. So how he did it is to bend both knees to an extreme. So the only way he could play snooker was by doing this. As you, as you can see, the neck and the back are in one line. And depending on what position gives you the most comfort, and doesn't require too much of a workout with the thighs, this player had to uh, develop great thigh muscles. You should experiment with that and find out what relieves the pressure so that you can play snooker sustainably. So what I would do is, I'll demonstrate it left-handed as well, so you can go here. For me that's a bit restricted with the chest on the cue. As I lift higher it does move the chest away from the cue actually. And if I did that and I'm too high, that would feel okay. If I had to have both knees bent, that would feel okay to be here. And there are pros who stand like this. More commonly now than in the 1980s where the dogma was to have the back leg locked straight and very tight. But since, since the 90s, a lot of players have released the back pressure of that knee and just put a slight, almost invisible bend in the knee it looks straight, but the tension, it's not pushed back, it's just a little bit more relaxed, less tension in the body then. But some players, some of the pros are uh, slightly bent, as we've noticed, and the important thing is finding an optimum way to stand and be at the table that allows one thing to happen, to deliver the cue properly. Whatever we do here today serves only your ability to deliver the cue straight and at the correct height and at the correct speed. So anything to do with technique always serves the cue moving straight at the correct height at the correct speed. Not for technique's sake, not for dogma, not to listen to me, not to listen to someone on the forum or the telly or the guy in the club or even your own mind. Test what works, test what helps you deliver the cue better. If it works, do it. If it doesn't, don't do it. Let's go back to some questions. So, Will Fox, near Watford, asks a good question. So, should we approach like Sean Murphy or Judd Trump? Now, the two different ways to approach the shot are being a cure or a stopper. What do we mean by that? Well, Sean Murphy is a cure. As he gets down, he's queuing up already, if that makes sense. You watch him and you'll see that. He's queuing up already. I'm exaggerating slightly. And when he's down, he's already in the flow and delivers the cue. Judd Trump, however, is a stopper. So, better do a left-handed impression of Judd. So, he'll stop the cue, and then cue up, and play the shot. So again, this is personal preference, there is no right and wrong. And if I demonstrate left and right-handed, for me personally, as a right-handed player, I'm a cure. So I'm queuing as I go down. As a left-handed player, I feel I benefit from the, from the reassurance of being a stopper. 
So I need to stop, make sure I'm on the centre of the cue ball, line of aim is correct, and then start queuing up. Okay? So the answer is, it's personal. It's a personal preference. Great question, thank you. So Marco Boscovich from Montenegro, another question uh, that I'll be answering was, because uh, you answered a question the first time round. So the question is, where should the hand hit the chest? So this is a great vantage point to demonstrate that from. What you want is for the hand, once you're in the comfortable position, you want the hand to follow through like a piston and be stopped by the chest. Too many players tighten the hand and put the brakes on the hand before it's hit the chest. Almost all players below 80 break standard do that. I don't think I've ever seen a player below 40 or 50 highest break follow through properly because they're scared of hitting the chest. It feels unnatural or weird or strange and also they're tightening the hand so much there's no fluidity. I mean, imagine a golfer only being able to follow through three feet. He's not going to get the power and the effortless speed on the ball, is he? So what we want, and you, I recommend practicing this without a cue ball. So you practice coming back and then allowing the chest to stop the hand. And then, with, unless you're playing a roll-up snooker, obviously that's not going to require the hand. There's not enough inertia in the hand to finish in the chest. Any shots above 2 out of 10 speed or so uh, are going to have enough inertia to finish in the chest. So even if I play soft or with speed, hitting the same part of the chest. Okay, good question. Jed McDonald from Liverpool asks, what are the mistakes that cause players to jump the cue ball with screw shot? I think we've answered that in the beginning, but it's generally tightness, over eagerness to screw back, and over expectation uh, to do what they do on television. Remember that on television, Jed, the cloth is faster than any club table has ever been. The balls are brand new, the tables are heated, there's no humidity on the cloth, all the balls so they run so quickly. In the clubs the balls are dirty, there's humidity on them, the cloth is worn, so there's, I don't know, ten times more friction on the ball as there would be on the television. Imagine coating the balls with glue in the club, that's almost what it's like playing a club compared to television, so it's a very fair, unfair comparison to compare yourself, compare and despair, to compare and despair yourself against a professional level a table and player who's been practicing 20 years non-stop. So it's partly expectation and then it's partly trying to do too much. Firstly with a cue, first, secondly with a strength and thirdly with a cue ball. Let's go to see some live questions. So, wow, thanks for all the great input guys, this is terrific. So Dan Chan from Singapore, what's the ideal cue length, about shoulder height, give or take? The answer does depend slightly on your arm span, your height, and also one other thing which is why as a player evolves they can adjust the length of cue that is optimum for them. My shoulders, they're, they're square 90 degrees to the line of aim. So my bridge hand is not very far in front of my face. But if I twist my shoulders a bit more, it pushes the bridge hand further forward. So then instead of needing to hold the cue here, Now I need to hold the cue here. 
to have the same length of bridge hand. But generally speaking, about uh, armpit height. Uh, the big mistake, Dan, is that players always, almost always, especially in the clubs, they think, oh, there's the cue, I need to hold the end of it. So what they end up doing is being in the address position and the back arm is backwards or vertical instead of the more ideal vertical arm position at address. So this is so common for players to be holding inappropriately at the end of the cue. So go for vertical cueing arm at address, not holding at the end of the cue. Okay, Louis Hutton, I thought that said Lewis Hamilton actually. Uh, Louis Hutton from Grimsby, I can screw back on a pool table. I'm assuming you mean English pool because the white ball is smaller. Uh, so it's much easier to screw back than with a snooker table where the balls are the same weight. Chris Pedersen, Canada. Thank you very much from Canada. Um, when I'm approaching my highest rate, I begin to feel pressure. Well, welcome to the rest of the snooker world. I think every player needs to embrace their relationship to pressure. So, accepting that you feel pressure and that you're nervous is invaluable. And admitting it to somebody. You don't have to admit it, admit it to your opponent although it might actually take them off guard and work in your favour, but admitting that you feel pressure is the greatest release because then you can, you can just work on watching the thoughts and the emotions float by like clouds or like a stick on a stream. Watch them float by and float past and float beyond. So these thoughts and emotions, they won't stay. They can't stay forever. And no matter what you do, if you try and keep one set thought or emotion in your mind for 10 seconds, one minute, one hour, one day, it's not going to happen. It can't happen. So accept that all emotions are transient and fluid. Accept that you have pressure. Accept that you have fear. Accept that you're terrified. It's okay to be terrified and scared and nervous and feel pressure especially when you're approaching your last break. That is a big deal. That's important. Even professionals will feel pressure when they're approaching a 147 or a tournament win or a, a big match win that uh, is a first in their career, for example. So we've all got this pressure. And it reminds me of a quote. It doesn't get easier, we just get better. So what that means is, as you practice allowing the feeling and the thought of pressure to float on and float by, you'll be less affected by it and your, your circle of competence, your, your ability to deal with pressure will increase, will expand. The other thing is to love pressure. Uh, Alex Higgins and Peter Ebden of, of Daly Thompson, these great champions, have said that uh, they love the pressure. So instead of being scared of it, learn to enjoy it use it as a challenge. As much as, as snooker is a challenge, pressure is a mental challenge. Good question. So many questions here. Uh, Any time I play reverse side, it only seems to work sometimes. That's Mick 20A. I don't know where you're from, Mick. So reverse side is where the cue ball screws back with side spin and changes direction off the cushion. So I'll demonstrate that now with side spin to come toward the camera. 
So if the camera stays where it is, we'll see the white coming off with side spin toward you. So there you go. I've got it in this pocket. I've got to have a, have another go at that. My excuse is I'm not used to potting cue balls, so let's give that another go. So the reason for that, so up here I'm playing, here I think what, what many players, the mistake many players do is they try to play, if we just zoom in here look, they're trying to play minus four, but with minus four you can't put any side spin, you've got to go a bit higher to maybe minus three, then you can put if that's zero at the centre, that's minus four, that's plus four at the top of the white. Minus three allows you to go over to left hand side, so I'm going to put a little bit more side on this shot. So the previous shot, I was about here. I'm now going to go over here to left number four. That gives us a bit more angle off the cushion. So again, it's a question of experimenting until you get a, until you hit the limit. And I would practice playing side spin until you do the magic miss cue. So keep playing left until you go to minus uh, left number five, and until you get the miss cue, I think you'll be surprised at how much side you can play before you miss cue. So give that a go and let us know in comments how you get on with it. So Valley's Commando, why is it that Higgins and Selby almost come off the bridge hand because they are taking the cue back? So, a point for debate, I'm going to reverse that question back. So John Higgins, we'll take John Higgins. So he's played some of the best snooker he's ever played in the last few weeks. And in the last couple of years, I made a post of this on Facebook where there's a picture of him doing this and there was chalk on his bridge hand, showing that he's pulling back all the way to the bridge. One thing is for absolute certain, if we can zoom in here to the bridge hand, if the tip comes back to the V, can you see the tip moving offline there? As I pull the cue back, the tip does come offline as it comes into the V. Can you see that? So it is flirting with danger. It is flirting with danger to have the tip come back all the way to the bridge hand. Is John getting away with it or is he benefiting from the security of feeling it comes back to the V every time? In my opinion, most players uh, need an extra inch on the bridge hand. If they are pulling the cue back onto the bridge, I just recommend they put another inch on the bridge hand because the other thing is if they're coming back to the bridge uh, it will probably be restricting the backswing in some way so that leads to snatching because you don't have the space to accelerate the cue and push through the cue ball uh, and that snatching that extra strength required uh, means that uh, we're pulling the cue off the line okay What else have we got? So Morteza Wejdani from Bahrain. I don't know where you are at the moment. You tend to travel to three or four countries a month. But for screw shots, what is the error margin regarding to tip size? Well, you can use a 12 or 13 millimeter American pool cue and ride the cue along the cloth, and you cannot miss cue. So a 12 to 13 millimeter tip means you can't miss cue unless you're digging down on the ball. 
Equally, I mean, we've all seen players who have used an 8mm tip, but then it becomes very difficult to strike the middle of the cue ball. You can screw back with both. Probably easier to put spin on the ball with a smaller tip, but then you sacrifice accuracy. So most players are using between 8.75 to 9.5 millimeters these days as an average. So if you're outside those parameters, you tend to be sacrificing a bit of spin if the tip is too fat, uh, or a bit of power and a bit of accuracy if it's going toward 8 millimeters. Wow, so many questions. I keep saying that. Okay, so I think we'll finish off with Barry Hurd. So what's the best practice routine? I don't know where you're from Barry, maybe you can let us know. I don't know where the best practice routine is. Uh, I, I don't know um, where you're from Barry, just let us know. But the best practice routines you can do if you've only got half an hour or so what I tended to do was uh, do three of each so I would do three tough shots of pinks in the middle because I tend to be used to miss those I think it's important when you've got a pink in the middle at the beginning of a match that you're comfortable with it three reds down the cushion I do three of those. I do three blacks with the cue ball very low, three blacks with the cue ball very high, three long straight pots, three safety shots back to bulk, and maybe three power shots. So that might take 10 minutes to do those. And then I do a little break building routine. So putting five reds here, not a full lineup, but five reds between pink and black, and either play until you get the highest score that you can or if you miss just continue uh, to, to get a sense of flow and rhythm at the table or if you miss it keep playing it again until you play it to get a sense of precision and confidence either way is personal preference depending on the situation what I've seen a number of professionals do is in the interval especially if they've been blocked off the table and I saw Peter Ebden do this quite a lot actually, uh, especially when you're being blocked off the table, is to just do a lineup. The interval is 15 minutes, go away, do a lineup. You might not have an interval in the matches you're playing, but that's quite a good way for a player to get in rhythm, get in flow. Snooker is equally as about cueing as it is about rhythm, flow, tempo, fluency. So, uh, as an example, so I. We, uh, we had a, one of my students once, we set a target of doing it, he wanted to do a thousand long pots in a week. So he did 150 a day, but it can work against you in tempo, it can break your tempo, break your rhythm. And equally, if you're doing too many lineups, I've done this before, I did five hours of lineups with all the balls between blue and top cushion, all the reds between blue and top cushion, I did five hours of that the day before a tournament, think the day before a match, pro match, thinking this is great, you know, I'm going to be really flowing when I go to my match, but it was a disaster. I couldn't put anything unless I was in a lineup position. It looked totally alien unless it was in a lineup position. So you can have too much of individual shots and too much of the same break building routine. So 
that's a quick, quite a quick distillation of what I learned that really helped me to get ready before a match. Now, you don't always have a chance to do that. Your plan B would just to be snatch two or three minutes on a table before your match starts, or get to the table before your opponent does, and just queue up a few times if it's if you feel it's maybe rude to or inappropriate to play a shot, and if the ball's already set up, for example, you can just practice queuing two or three times, do a full follow through, hand to the chest. You can keep doing that three, four, five, six times just to loosen the muscles a bit. The other thing you could do, you can do some stretches before the match, go to the bathroom, do a few stretches just to open the shoulders and get the legs loose, this type of thing. So you can do that. The other thing, when we used to play in Prestatin, for all the tournaments that were held up there, there was no practice. So what I think most of the players used to do, I certainly did, they had a little coffee table in the chalets in the apartments. And I used to just pretend that I was making a hundred break. So I'd play one shot on the table. Imagine I've got another shot on the snooker table and deliver that and just do 10, 20, 30 shots until I felt comfortable and relaxed in the body. So I hope that gives you some ideas on how to prepare for matches. So now I'm going to announce the prize winner. So best question award for the day. So I'm going to award the pre-question to uh, Tony Pretty and also Alan Razan had the same question about queuing to the chest. It's such a common problem with players that I thought it would help a lot of players to answer that uh, today. So thanks for the very insightful question. I felt, hope you felt the answer was insightful. So you've got a choice of either the aim frame, which helps you learn potting angles in seconds. It only took us four years and about 10 grand to develop, at least. That was direct cost in time, 20, 25 grand that cost us to develop that. Or the ultimate training ball. So we'll send you one of those, depending on which one you want. In terms of the live questions, the best one was, let's just find this because I want to make sure I've got the right one. Yeah, I'm going to go with Chris Pedersen on the highest break pressure question because it's slightly different to what you would normally expect, which is technique and cueing and shot making, that's to do with the psychological part of the game which is such a big hidden part of the game, it's almost like dark matter in the universe, it's there but we can't see it. So for raising that topic on the, this hidden part of snooker that's so huge and so important, I uh, would like to offer you one of these products according to what you'd, uh, what you'd prefer. If you can just message me, uh, Chris, and I will send one of those out to you. So, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us today and for being such a support and sharing us on social media. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you join us on the next live session. Tell your friends about it. Tell them to subscribe to the channel so they get more updates. And uh, just finally, one more thing, we do, I've sold out the Q Action Trainers, which is the device to give you immediate, relevant and perfectly accurate feedback on the quality of your queuing. If anyone wants one, I've decided to make another 50 units. So if you want the quickest way to perfect queuing, 
I'm making 50 more of these, they'll be ready for delivery in March. So drop me a message and I'll reply to that. So thanks very much. Signing off, I've been Nick Barrow. Enjoy the rest of your day. So that the difference in height that I played there was probably only two millimetres or so. This is the Snooker Gym Player of the Year for 100 ranked players. You come to a stop in a controlled way and begin the delivery in a controlled way as well.